You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but I gotta let it breathe so we can get Facebook in the room with us. And we will uh, get tonight's Huddle Up podcast cooking, baby. Looks like we're live on YouTube. We're live. I got five green check marks, so it's go time. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my fellow football priest and the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kalberman. Zach, we are now one day removed from the reveal, right? The decision, which was a tectonic one, all right? I felt the plates of the earth shift beneath my feet. Wink. Okay, but it was a momentous decision that Vic Fangio made going with Teddy Bridgewater yesterday. Our uh, Huddle Up podcast episode was was quite salty. Uh, Emotions, the hormones were running pretty hot. We have expressed those. This is the aftermath episode. How are you feeling today? It was so salty. I'm dehydrated. I have extra water on me on hand today, Chad. I'm feeling, you know, pretty much the same as yesterday. I wasn't surprised that much that Teddy got the nod. I felt really bad for Drew. But my secondary thought right after, you know how in a game they tell you, okay, you have tonight to revel in your misery about this loss, but tomorrow you got to turn the page and look forward? I look forward with my second thought. I look forward to week one. I look forward to the season. There are still 17 games at the minimum to be played with Teddy at quarterback and the Broncos on the field. We still think they're going to have a good year. It really hasn't dampered my feeling about the Broncos. Maybe Vic Fangio a little bit, but not about the Broncos as a team. I think even with Teddy at quarterback, they're bound for big things. I want to see Teddy succeed. I want to see the Denver Broncos have a good season. And I define that, pardon me, uh, as a winning season that results in a qualification for the NFL playoff tournament. I want to see that happen. You know, it's uh, as long as I've been paying attention to the Denver Broncos, which is pro- approaching rapidly about 40 years, there's never been a stretch of five years with missing the playoffs. And, you know, we know that this is the darkest five year period in the team's history, dating all the way back to the AFL days, right? In the 60s and, and things just getting started. And so, look, I want to see the team win. And you made the decision to go with Teddy. That was clearly in the interest of making hay while the sun is shining today, this year, capitalizing on that. So I want to see that happen, Zach. I want to see the Broncos go out there, win their first three games. We'll see what happens with the Baltimore game. But as everyone can see here, I'll do a quick share screen. The first quarter of this schedule, hey, man. It's you heard us talk about it last night. It's relatively soft. You got the Giants to open up, followed by another road trip to Jacksonville, take on Trevor Lawrence. Gonna be without his trusty Travis Etienne, who is done for the year, Sucks. by the way. Injuries. Very Sucks. unfortunate. Uh, and then followed by week three at home. That's their the Broncos home opener. We'll be there with the MHH tent. Yes, that's sir. the big day for the meet and greet. We look forward to seeing everybody there. And then those three games, I mean, you got Daniel Jones, third year Q. Rookie, rookie, and then you get Lamar week four. So it is incumbent upon Teddy. It is incumbent upon Vic Fangio after a decision as controversial as the one he made yesterday to ensure you don't get to this game here against Pittsburgh any worse than three and one. Man, look at that second second quarter of the schedule there. Baltimore, Pittsburgh, the, the Raiders who swept the Broncos last year and what's week seven, the Browns who are the the sweetheart choice this year in the AFC. And you have Washington, who is a sneaky good defense. You don't know how they're going to be on offense. They have some weapons as well. The Cowboys have a great offense. I mean, this does not get easy for Denver after the first three weeks. And I've been saying this, whether it's Locke, whether it's Teddy, whether it's Brett Rippon, anyone under center, they have to win the games they should win. And they should beat Daniel Jones, who I have no confidence in at all. Saquon Barkley coming off a a season-ending injury. Jacksonville, Urban Meyer, I give him two years before he's fired. Trevor Lawrence will go through some ups and downs. And New York, they lost their best pass rusher recently in Carl Lawson. They have a rookie head coach, a rookie quarterback. That should be a 3-0 record for the Broncos. But let's assume so. 
going into week four, we just talked about this, Chad, on our little show with the Facebook audience. This is where, starting in week four, this is where Teddy Bridgewater might have to go one-on-one with his counterpart and take over the game, or at least keep pace. That would mean Lamar Jackson. It's easy to get ahead on Zach Wilson, Lawrence, Daniel Jones, but Lamar is a dynamic quarterback. Lamar can do things that Teddy can only dream about, and Drew Locke for that matter. So come crunch time, starting in week four at the earliest, if not earlier, it's going to be incumbent upon Teddy to foist the team upon his shoulders when the running game gets shut down, when the defense lets up a few touchdowns. In crunch time, can the Broncos quarterback beat the other team? We'll know fairly soon. Shout out to Michael Ronquillo for his shout out to Broncos fans around the world. One of those is Pete Myhill, who's down in uh, Australia, right? And he's rocking his hoodie like a boss. Send us a uh, picture of that, Pete, because I right. think you did on Instagram, and I messaged you back today because for whatever reason, it didn't come through. It was like some kind of expiring image, and I just barely saw it, so it's probably a week or two old, and so it's gone. I couldn't get it. So resend that uh, if you wouldn't mind doing, my if friend. He's, if he's allowed to in Australia right now, I hope you're free, Peter. It's crazy. Hope you're free. Ho- hope you're uh, staying safe. Hope you're healthy, my dog. Zach, today is, yeah, it's aftermath. We're going to be talking a lot about kind of, you know, where things go from here. I want to focus on what this team can be. Now that Teddy, we got resolution at quarterback, the offense, what it's going to look like. But it's also Mile High Mailbag Day. We're going to take a peek inside the mailbag because we are your football priests each and every week. We're here to offer you the absolution and answers to your burning Broncos questions. And sometimes, especially coming out of a day like yesterday, you need to unburden your soul, exercise some demons. We're going to be here for that as well. But Zach, a few matters of business. We got some uh, some housekeeping to do and update everybody real quick on where things stand on the uh, Von Miller jersey. First off on – oh, there we go. Now let me do it like this. Okay. On our goal as far as subscriptions – Shout out to all of our newest supporters on Facebook who have signed up and pulled the trigger over the last week or so. We're 44% of the way there. Thank you, guys. A hoodie, when we reach goal, we're going to give out a hoodie and a little something-something, so appreciate you guys. And by the way, when someone subscribes and becomes a supporter on Facebook, they're not just giving 5 bucks a month to MHH. They're giving 5 bucks a month to MHH, and we're giving them something back in the form of our VIP premium podcast content. For supporters only, which includes Kelberman's Corner on Sundays, the Trickle Zone on Saturdays, and Broncos Book Club with yours truly on Saturdays, uh, and more to come. Here's where we stand, Zach, on the Von Miller wow. jersey giveaway. We Our were goal, just in the 30s. It's 72 now. It's I know. crazy. It was less than two weeks ago. We were in the 30s. Less than two weeks. Um, we want to get to 500,000 stars on Facebook. When we do reach the goal, we are going to raffle off a Von Miller jersey, and to go along with that, a little special memento that's MHH-oriented to go in your fan cave or man cave that I think you will appreciate. The only people in the running for that raffle and that drawing are those who contributed to the goal, and the way we're going to be able to know that, who did what, how much, how many tickets for each person goes in the hat when we do the drawing, Facebook keeps track of that for us. All right, here's the rankings as we've been showing it each and every night so everyone knows where we're at. Zeus, Still with a pretty comfortable Zeus. lead, Zach, but Randy has been closing the gap pretty quickly. Andrew Lampy at three, Travis Weber at four, Howie Frickin' Day at five, Michael at six, Travis Tarbox at seven, Gary Leeds Palmer at eight, Andrew Baker at nine, Sean Miller at 10. And then you've got guys like Simon and Butch and Claude and Brian Bowman and Shane Daniels, Pete Middleton, just outside that top 10. Now, guys, it's a form of consolation. All right, but when we finally do the drawing, once we reach goal, we're going to pick that winner. All right, the more someone has starred, the more tickets they're going to have in the hat. And then we also are going to have a little consolation prize for the top five people who fit in the, who finished in the rankings. All right, and just trust us, you're going to love what that consolation prize is for each person. All right, a couple other quick things and we'll dive right into the chat. Guys, make sure we've been a, we've kind of been loosey goosey on this the last week or so because the chat has been so hot, but. We want to make sure everyone knows how to connect with us on social media, starting with Twitter, connect with the podcast at Huddle Up Pod, and our main account at Mile High Huddle. My partner here is Zach Kelberman on Twitter at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. Also, 
Check out the merch store when you get a second, huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on. There are hats, as you can see us both. He's got the dad hat. I've got the flat bill, football priest hat, T-shirts, hoodies, face masks, whatever your favorite podcast is. There's a little swag for that. If you want to get a little something, something to rep every podcast, you can do that. It's just another great way to support what we're doing here, huddleuppod.com. And then also, guys, kindly, if you're on Facebook, and I know most of you are, make sure you're following the Huddle Up Podcast Facebook page. All right, facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle Pod. All right. And then, guys, if you're not able to do those things, it's all good. We're seriously just stoked to have you with us. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you enjoy the show, whether you're live or listening on demand. Like this video kindly. All right. If you're on YouTube and Facebook in particular, guys, give us a like. Might not agree on everything, right? But if you respect the effort, like this video. And hey, Share it out there, too. Help us continue to grow. Reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. All right, Zach. Let's see what's on everybody's mind here in the chat. Um, By the way, I don't know if you saw this today, Zach, but something a little bit concerning, a development from today, no fan is hurt. We learned from Vic Fangio today he's suffering from a lower, one of those mysterious lower leg injuries, which to me is highly, highly highly concerning because you know he had an ankle issue last year that he fought through so i hope that uh he gets enough r&r between now and september 12th to get that behind him god i'm so shocked the broncos have a lower leg injury a player with a lower leg injury chad that's never happens to them it's it's par for the course unfortunately but hopefully nothing serious i think james palmer from nfl network reported on this a couple days ago he noticed that noah fan was limping off to the side and asked fangio about it it's minor, supposedly, just like Melvin Gordon's injury was minor, yet he hasn't played in two preseason games. We have to keep our fingers crossed that he's healthy for week one. Maurice says, I'm cooking New York steaks tonight, and like the beginning of every MHH pod, I'm going to let them breathe for a bit. You got to. You got to let those breathe. If you don't let them rest, you will regret it. Any, any man or woman that knows their way around a grill knows, especially red meat or anything that you've smoked, you got to let it rest. Crucial, crucial step. I know by the time it's done, you want to cut right into that sucker, but you got to let it rest. The juices. At least 10 minutes. Yes, at least 10 minutes. Keep those juices locked in. Uh, Okay, let me me. me jump down here. Yeah, you guys are going to see some of these comments in the chat. Last night, because the chat was so hot and heavy, we weren't able to devote as much of our attention to Facebook as we normally would, and so we did a Facebook only stream right before we went live for the main podcast here. So Steven, it's good to have you back. It was a good break too. And Aaron, what's up, buddy? Good to see you. Big A, little a, R O N. All right. Jonathan with a super chat. Thank you, bro. He says they will bench Teddy. If he loses three or four games straight, you have to, at that point, if you're trying to save your job this year as a coach, I think that's true for pretty much anyone not named, you know, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers. Dak Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, you lose three or four games straight in the league. Odds are you got the coaches taking a look at making a change under center. Yeah, I I actually, you know, um, Stephen, to to your point, I use our five minute break to catch up on some tweeting. And someone asked um, if Teddy starts losing, they're going to have to take him out. The first one that gets the starting out is the first one that can get benched. It's a fair point. I just have a feeling that Teddy's leash is is pretty long. Pause. And I feel like Drew Locke's leash isn't as long. Pause. So if I feel like if Drew Locke lost two games in a row, they would be yanking him out. But I feel like if Teddy lost, you know, he would survive two games. Three, I don't know about that. But I feel like Fangio is going to give Teddy chance after chance after chance. And maybe until George Payton himself has to, has to step in and correct things. Probably. Because now, Zach, you've also got pride on the line a little bit too, right? I mean, you just made a controversial decision at quarterback and I mean at some point if that's how it shakes out if Teddy struggles and I hope he doesn't I hope he does not struggle but if at some point that happens Fangio will have to balance pride versus saving the season right we'll see how that plays out Colby says I feel a bit worse with Zach reading those Teddy stats Zach while I while I find the next super chat here um, explain to people what we were talking about on in terms of statistics for Teddy relative to his experience versus Drew. Well, let's give the context because, as we say, context always matters here. And we were talking about how Teddy historically has 
performs like a backup quarterback in the NFL. He doesn't have the upside like Locke maybe would have. And I was looking up the stats, and it became aware to me that in a in a best-case Drew Locke season, let's say he throw for 30, well, Teddy Bridgewater has never thrown more than 15 touchdowns in a given season. And that was last season when he set that quote-unquote personal record for himself. Meanwhile, Drew Locke last year, all his faults in his second season, all that went wrong, including his own play, threw 16 touchdowns. Just saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, and people like to point to, hey, Teddy was having himself one heck of an efficient season uh, until he, he had that little knee tweak down the stretch, and he was, but it wasn't coming out in the wash. There's a difference between being efficient and productive. If you can balance those two things as a quarterback, you're on to something. Shane Daniels, what's good, buddy? Thank you for the support. He says, I'm about to place my bet on the over for receptions by Gordon and Williams. Yeah. Hashtag check down. Smart. And yes, uh, coining the new uh, hashtag, make them regret. We like it. We like it, buddy. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> We're going to make that into a t-shirt pretty soon. But, I feel but like. listen, yeah. Uh, but listen, here's the thing, guys. We really, we really need to swing the conversation away from acrimony, bitterness. Teddy's the guy for now. So let's, let's be the examples of that, Zach. And let's start talking about what this offense can do. It's a joke, yes. Gordon Williams, they're going to catch a lot of balls. Teddy likes to check it down. But let's start with the rushing attack, all right? You've gotten to see now, Zach, what is it? Four or five total drives, maybe one or two more than that now that I think about it, with the first team offensive line on the field. The first game, Broncos were breaking off runs at will. Second game, they weren't. That, St- that Seattle front seven, even the backups, they were stingy as you know what made me a little bit more concerned about how bullish we'd been about this rushing game coming alive in 2021. We weren't seeing any holes busted open and the runners first contact for the most part, we're going down. Yeah. Well, we're going to be fair here and there's more things that go into an offense and it's production than just the quarterback, including the, the play calling and including the offensive line play and the offensive line did not play well at all in the Seattle game. Teddy, as a quarterback, played a lot better than the OL played as a collective there. So they have to all get on the same page, and that's why, at the very minimum, I'm happy they named a starter now. It was a little too late for my liking, but now going forward, they can all get on the same page, and that offensive line can coalesce with Teddy Bridgewater. Bridgewater can coalesce with Cushenberry as the center. They can get all the first-team reps together, and hopefully they get that running game going as it should be. Matthew says, Fangio hasn't won a single game in September. We're not going 3-0. and I mean, you're right. He hasn't. 0-4 the first quarter of his first season, 1-3 uh, and three the second. And best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. But at the same time, Zach, that was then, this is now. And one thing that you're missing in that equation, Matthew, is 2019 the Broncos had a top five strength of schedule. 2020, they were the second toughest schedule. This year, they're bottom third, man. So it's just a softer schedule. The onus is on Fangio to make some hay quick. It's been a little too long for a hot take, so here's my hot take. If they don't win a game this September, they should fire Vic Fangio. There is absolutely no excuse for them to go 0-3 facing two rookie quarterbacks and the Giants off the bat. And let me tell you something. If you don't fire him and you start 0-3 and you somehow make the playoffs, they wouldn't belong in the playoffs anyway. So they better win a game this September. Vic Fangio better get corrected or else he will end up with a, I think, a deserved pink slip. Uh, We're going to grab Powell here and then update on stars for the night because we've got some pretty hardcore flexes going on in the stars department. Uh, our pal says, do you guys think the fans will boo Teddy at the game? And do you think fans will erupt when I'm going to go ahead and scratch when and put, if Drew steps onto the field of play, I hope Broncos fans don't do that. And I believe Broncos fans are classy enough not to boo Teddy Bridgewater off the bat, but Broncos fans, just like they did with Peyton, right. things aren't going well. Right. And it's over time. They'll, they'll get the booze out. Drew's been booed. I mean, Flacco was booed. Elway was booed. Plummer was booed. Cutler was booed. That's sports, man. Your team, if they're really sucking it up, the fans are going to boo. I pray to God and I really expect 
that's not going to happen to Teddy off the cuff. And yeah, I think that if fate wills Drew taking the field at any point, I think he'll get a pretty warm reception from fans for the most part. Yeah, you're right. I, every quarterback, every player, when a team is losing and they're playing badly, they get booed. It doesn't matter how good you are. I mean, when, remember when Andrew Luck retired during that game and he and they were booing the hell out of him? A franchise legend who they loved five minutes ago and then five minutes later they were booing. That's not the test to me. The test to me is when they're doing good and Teddy shows some emotion on the sideline. Maybe he's even dancing and rapping on the sideline. How will that be received? Is he going to draw criticism like Drew Locke did? That's what I want to see this season. Simon, wow, dude. That is a – I mean, you already co-own the biggest individual star donation uh, of all time, and now you are the sole owner of the second – So. Shout out to you, my friend. We'll keep an eye out thank for you, any Simon. of your comments, questions. Uh, Casey Nickel, thank you, brother. Ron Frey, thank you, brother. Gary, love you. Jay Helms, Travis Weber, thank you, guys. Michael, Melvin, Jared, did we ever settle that? It's got to be Jared, right? Got to be Jared. Rod. Talking about Facebook, legendary Facebook supporter of MHH. He says, it will be hot and cold excitement on the field. A defense that will wreak havoc with opposing offenses and a yawning offense that will try to keep our defense off the field by eating up the clock. To me, that's the worst case scenario, honestly. The worst case scenario is that this offense, despite the coaches thinking that, you know, Teddy was the best solution, the, the worst case scenario is it being a yawning offense because of how much talent this team has on offense. Man, Teddy. Let's let's hope he becomes a true expert distributor of the ball because honestly guys, you just got to get it to Corlin. You just got to get right. it to Judy. You just got to get it to Noah, to KJ, to Pookie, to Melvin. Let them do the heavy lifting. And when defenses start sucking up and start really consuming those short areas, you know, you just got to be good enough to get them in the play action and hit them over the top once or twice in a game. And as long as you can do that and execute Zach you'll be able to effectively, I think, keep defenses on their heels. Easier said than done, but there is a model. Yeah, you know, if I'm watching the Broncos this year on offense and I find myself going, oh, as long as they score touchdowns, I really don't care if they score on one play or if they score on 20 plays. As long as they get into the end zone and as long as they win games and as long as they're competitive – and God willing, as long as they make the playoffs, I really don't care what it looks like. I would prefer to have a quarterback that would present more uh, of, a, of an arm fear, strike more fear into an opposing defense. But as long as they score, I don't care how the sausage is made, Chad. Casey Nickel. Hey, bro. Casey Nickel, very legendary. He's supporting us on Facebook. He's supporting us on YouTube. Props to you. All I see in that schedule is W's. We're going to the playoffs as a wild card. The Broncos will be back. From your lips to the, to the ears of the football gods, Casey, you know, that's the mark of a bad team. The mark of a bad team is you don't win the games you're supposed to. What games are you supposed to win? Well, when you're at home and you're going against a sub-500 team, you're supposed to win that game, regardless of if you're also a sub-500 team, Right. Broncos over the last five years, haven't. It, it was flip a coin in those games. You never knew if they were going to show up and handle their business or get embarrassed. That will tell us a lot. Those Just those first three games, Zach, I know the first two are on the road, and so people, if the Broncos struggle, knock on wood, I hope they don't, but if the Broncos struggle on the road in New York, the excuses are going to come out that, hey, it's an East Coast game, early start, travel, you know, and then same with Jacksonville early game they're just working out the kinks you know rust falling off by that third game at home against the jets if you're not firing on some on some serious cylinders you're not really going to be able to explain that away considering the strength of those first three games schedule wise yeah i've been watching football for about i don't know i'm 32 so i would say 28 years since i can remember i've I've never believed in games that are your must, you know, easy, no, no thought about it, you know, slam dunk victories. I learned that in 2017 when the Broncos were coming out of their bye week at home. Remember this game on primetime, Chad, against the winless Giants. 
and they came out and Brutal. got thrashed in that game. That's that's what killed it to me, and that's what emphasized any given Sunday. So I say the Broncos should start 3-0. I'm not saying they will start 3-0. They're still NFL opponents, and anything can always happen. But on paper, they are so much more talented than the Jaguars, than the Giants, than the Jets. They should be 3-0. There's no excuse. They have a lighter schedule, the best defense they've had since SB50, the best offense. If it comes together, you have to align expectations. So when you're going against the Jaguars team, you expect this Broncos team to beat them. It's as simple as that. If you made the right decision at quarterback, you expect Teddy to handle those opponents. Right. If you made the right decision, and only time will tell. Ian says, hello, gentlemen. I think Teddy was the right choice for Denver. He's a game manager, and that's what the team needed to let the D run, baby. Well, tell that to the D, because the D doesn't want to carry all the water anymore. (laughs) For real, Ian. They want the offense to start carrying their fair share of the water. So are we going to lean on the defense all year? Because if that's the MO, why'd you go with Teddy? You know, go with Drew. Either way, it doesn't matter. That it's in, the, it's in the past. But if you felt like Teddy was the right choice, hey, man, more power to you. There's a lot of reason to say, hey, no, I think we should go with Teddy. There are. We talked about it on that Facebook pre-stream. We talked about it last night, Zach. Phenomenal leader. He's already rallied the troops, and I think that was a big influence for Fangio, was seeing how guys around him who were pretty new to him still, how they responded to Teddy. So let's hope that that comes out in the wash by way of production and dubs in the standings. That's a really great point, Chad, because what we've been hearing in the post Peyton Manning era is the defense, the ones that have been there, like Von Miller, for example, they are tired of carrying the offense. They're tired of putting in a hundred percent of the work. It was like in high school in a group project, when all your group members didn't do anything, you were doing all the work for everybody else and they got all the credit for it. How maddening was that? Now imagine millions of dollars are at stake and everyone's watching you and you're pulling the weight for everyone. That's how the defense has been. So I understand that the point you're trying to make there, and Vic Fangio certainly wants that because it makes himself look like the hero, him being the defensive coordinator, but the defense doesn't want that. They want the offense to give them a breather. They don't want to put them on a long field with a deficit. They don't want all that like we've been seeing for five years now. So I kind of disagree with that premise. Andrew, excellent, excellent reminder. He says... Prayers for all our troops in Afghanistan and go Broncos. Terrible, terrible news, what we learned this morning. So uh, prayers up. Prayers up for our men and women in the service over there that uh, were attacked. And, you know, hats off. Moment of silence for those who are own, who lost their lives. Shout out to our veterans in the chat. Tough day. Um, God bless every American in Afghanistan. Yes. Travis, how long are the starters going to play against the Rams? We don't know yet. Vic Fangio has kind of vacillated on that. But we will see the starters, and I think you'll see a couple of series for Vaughn, a couple of series for Cortland. Yes, he's playing. Um, at least two series for Teddy. Teddy is going to play. Melvin. Melvin, yep. So I think it'll be basically not be on the first quarter, though. Like a traditional before the pandemic – the third preseason game, even with Peyton, uh, was the dress rehearsal. And typically what that meant, they'd start the game, they'd play through the whole first half, and the first possession coming out of the third quarter to get that feeling of, hey, we got a half, and then that feeling of going into the locker room, cooling down, and then having to come back out and be hot again. I don't think they'll go that far. I think you'll see the first quarter is when you'll see some starters. I'd be stunned if you're still really seeing the true ones out there it's quarter two and beyond. I'm going to say this, though. God help Vic Fangio if anything happens to anyone playing in this game, an unnecessary third preseason game. I, I pray it doesn't happen. I pray everyone gets out of there with you know injury-free. I understand they want reps for these guys, but at what cost? Uh, Black Knight, what's up, brother? Jeremy and the Hizzy, good to see you. Do you think the Broncos coach has sabotaged Locke on purpose? Not necessarily. I don't think it was a sabotage type thing. And if you're speaking specifically to the Seattle game where we weren't seeing the play action, we weren't seeing the moving pocket stuff for Drew and all that like we saw in game one, um, I don't think so. I would hope not. But more than sabotage, Zach, is the curious case of, hey, the coaches told Drew 
last year wasn't good enough. You need to show improvement in area X, Y, and Z. And he did. So it's like when he was at the podium last night, he told us when he was told by Vic Fangio, hey, we're going with Teddy. One of the things he asked Vic was, well, what could I have done different? What did you want to see from me that you didn't see? And according to Drew, and I doubt this is the truth because I'm sure Fangio did give him some context, to be frank with you, but according to Drew, is Fangio kept it straight and to the point. Hey, it was really close, Drew. It was really close. This is just what I feel is best for us now. He didn't really get an answer, according to Drew. I think he probably did, but I would be curious to hear what they said because he did answer the bell in many ways. Was he... And like we told you guys, don't expect Drew going into the training camp to suddenly look like Patrick Mahomes. Expect, though, and look for clear signs of progress and development. We saw those. And honestly, Zach, I saw more than I expected to see. So it is. that's one of the reasons why yesterday to me was still uh, surprising. It really was a little bit surprising because, hey, if he was truly your incumbent and he was truly the guy that you know you recognized as an organization, hey, We've developed this guy. We went through the blood, sweat, and tears. We sacrificed a losing season to get him experience. If he doesn't answer the bell and come back this year having shown progress, then I totally would have understood going with Teddy when not even looking back. But he didn't. So what's what? how do you answer that to Drew? If you're Vic Fangio, coach, what could I have done different? I'd love to have been a, a fly on the wall there. I think Locke's asking the wrong guy. Quite frankly, I think he's asking a guy who doesn't really know much about offense and he's going on what everyone else around him is uh, telling him or what the stats or analytics are telling him. I don't think they sabotaged Drew Locke. I do think they did not do him any favors and it kind of can work both ways. They fine tuned the play calling in the Minnesota game for Drew Locke and he succeeded. But the play calling against the, in the Seattle game could not been as... Um, the antithesis of what it was in the first game. And not only that, Chad, it was the opposite, and they based their decision, I think, off the second game. So when you do that, it's putting Locke in an unwinnable situation when you're not calling plays conducive to his own talents and then you're judging it off that game. Because, again, this is my own little conspiracy, but something changed in between week one and week two. The messaging changed, uh, the verbal announcements were changing, the way they were framing the quarterback battle was changing, and then they settled on Teddy as their guy kind of abruptly. So that's where I don't think sabotage, but I don't think it was totally fair in a sense either. Melvin Paulson, thank you for the stars today, brother. He says, Teddy's stats are in line with a guy that doesn't finish in the red zone. If you have a guy that doesn't have zip to the ball, you won't float a five-yard pass in the end zone. Good year to be a running back in Denver. That's true to a point. And here's what I mean by that, Zach. When we were talking about during the offseason and previewing the camp battle and we would get questions about, well, hey, you know, what if that Teddy does win this? What will it look like? And one of the things I said to people was, you know, I think the top end of what you could maybe hope for with Teddy is an Alex Smith like offense. What does that mean? Hey, he's efficient. Completion percentage is going to be where you want it to be. He's going to protect the ball. He's going to move the chains on third down. But when the defense or when the field gets shrunk and you're inside the 20s, that's when the limitations are going to come to the surface. Same as when Alex was in KC, you know, the peak of his career. Because he he started to peak that last year uh, or two in San Francisco with Harbaugh. But once he got with Andy, he really kind of came into his own, Andy Reid. And same thing, man. Like, he would move the ball. He was hard to sack. He would convert on third down. But the points wouldn't come. I mean, they were in the 20s. Don't get me wrong. It's not like Alex Smith was some incompetent buffoon. I'm not saying that. But, like, the palpable gap, Zach, between a Patrick Mahomes point total at the end of a Sunday versus an Alex Smith the year prior, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and that point that Melvin made right there cannot be more more apt. It's a great year to be a running back in Den- Denver, whether it's Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, Freeman, Mike Boone. And I was going to say earlier, what does a career renaissance year look like for Teddy Bridgewater this year? It looks like something that Alex Smith would do in Kansas City. 
And is that going to win you a title? And if the answer is no, then what's the point? Why not give yourself a chance with a quarterback that has a higher ceiling that maybe can get you there? I'm not saying Drew Locke will, but Teddy has shown what he can be and what he is. And you can win games like that. But like I said, though, if you're trying to prop up a, a QB2, like an understood quarterback one, like they did with someone named Joe Flacco, the results are not going to be there. But if you temper your expectations, it'll be a good year in Denver. Dave Bingaman, one of our longtime listeners, longtime MHH community maven. Appreciate you, bro. He says, I don't think a savvy owner would have allowed this. It's hard to say, man. There's been so much water that's passed under the bridge since Pat Bowen had to uh, step down. It's hard to say how he would have handled this. I mean, the majority of his tenure, I shouldn't say the majority, but a good chunk of his majority a good chunk of his time, pardon me, in uh, Denver as, as owner and active and running the team and there every day, you know, he had Elway, right? He was there 84 through 98, <clears throat> Elway with Bolin, because Elway came in 83, but Bolin came the year pri- uh, the year following. And then after that, you know, it was a guy that everyone considered to be an offensive genius in Mike Shanahan, and Pat Bolin never really st- had to step in because for the most part, Shanahan – did the right things when greasy wasn't good enough. He went out and got plumber. I'd be, I'd love to know how Pat felt about the decision to draft Cutler. He must've signed off on it to some extent, even though we know Mike had full control of roster and salary cap, he must've gotten some form of, all right, go for it from Pat when he turned in that draft card for Cuddy. But I would have died to have known Zach, how a guy like Pat Bolin felt about Mike Shanahan benching Jake Plummer. At seven and four, that's where the Broncos were record wise. They were comfortably in the lead in the AFC West, but they had lost two games in a row. And then he went to Cutler. They ended up backing out and missing the playoffs. Who knows? But there, I think there is some truth to the dysfunction that we have felt over the last five years. Maybe even the decision that was made yesterday. Does it happen under a savvy, competent owner? I don't know. It's what's the definition of savvy though? Does that mean a guy that makes good hires or is that a guy that steps in and is very hands-on like a Jerry Jones? Because a hands-on guy, I don't think he would have allowed an even Steven 50-50 quarterback competition to last until almost September. I think he would have stepped in there and ensured that one quarterback gets the nod. And if he's a guy who makes right hires, you have to wonder would they have hired Vic Fangio in the first place? Because I, I keep maintaining, Chad, Elway's biggest blunders weren't his quarterback picks. They were his head coaching picks. That set the domino effect for everything else. So it's always going to be a what if. What if Mr. B was still around? What if there was another owner in place that was kind of providing checks and balances in Denver? We'll never know the answer, but I think it would have been a little different at the minimum. Yes, indeed. Dave says, if we don't win a game in September, we need to win three games in September. Uh, yeah, if we don't, if the Broncos don't win a game in September, man, Fangio's in trub. Um, but I think there's a good chance that they'll at least go two and two in September, at least. I mean, I got enough faith in Teddy to believe you can go two and two with this with this squad and that schedule. Zero oh, and three, he he needs to get fired. Simple as that. Aaron says, "Why can't we all just be optimistic and wish for success instead of hating on everything so much?" We're not hating on anybody, dude. We're not hating on Teddy. We still question that decision, and we will until we're proven it's proven otherwise. Like if Teddy goes on to lead this team to the playoffs, and the Denver Broncos sign him to an extension, because he's 28, you know, he could feasibly play for another 10 years, right? The way modern quarterbacks go. If that's how it shakes out, he takes the the Broncos to the playoffs this year. He gets a nice extension, and this is a team that's a factor each and every year for the next decade. Hey, man. It'll have proven in hindsight to have been the correct call, but there's still a long row left to hoe until then. But we don't want anyone to wish ill to Teddy, to Vic, to any of that stuff. Hey, man, let's just see how the cookie crumbles. Let's see how these chips are going to fall and hope for the best. Let's hope this was the right decision and that Teddy is going to crush it. And you know what, Chad? We would have been saying the same thing if they would have made Locke the quarterback. We hope it was the right call. We hope Locke goes out and, and proves that he's the right guy. We, we wish the Broncos success. 
Don't wish Teddy injury. And another thing, don't give up on the season already. Don't threaten to jump ship or give up your Broncos fan card or not watch the games this year. Chad and I both maintain, and a lot of other people do as well. They're going to be competitive. They're going to maybe flirt with 10, 11 wins this year if things break correctly. It's going to be a fun year in Denver. Let's enjoy the ride while we're on it. Uh, We've got a super chat from uh, Aaron Lynch that I'm having to reverse engineer. Thank you, Aaron. Good to see you, Big A, Little A, R-O-N. He says, longtime superstar, by the way. He says, I want whoever our QB1 is to succeed, but I made it to Lumen for the game. Watched the physical reactions from Locke. Just seemed like he was set up to fall. Naming, oh, sorry, cuts off. Naming uh, the starter after that game just felt predetermined, like it was a matter of course. It kind of did feel that way, but I don't know that it was that way. I mean, even Vic Fangio said uh, before, so there was the facade on Tuesday, right, where he got up there and said, yeah, no decision yet. We're going to keep going. And then Wednesday out came the, the decision. But in that Tuesday presser, he had had time, of course, to watch his trusty film. And uh, Zach, he acknowledged that the protection breakdowns on Drew in the first his first two uh, dropbacks where he got sacked you know that was on the offensive line. I don't. I that that's not a conspiracy. You know the the guys just unfortunately in that moment when it was a big one for Drew, they didn't play up to their potential. But from there, it just didn't get that much better. You know, you would have liked to have seen Pat Shermer do some things schematically to loosen Drew up and kind of free him up from that and allow him to do what he does best. Kind of like we saw in that Minnesota game. Get him moving. Get some play action, get him some boots, get a moving pocket. We didn't see that. And so I'm always, you know, I understand why people are going to wonder about that, but I feel you, man. The momentum swung mightily coming out of Seattle for Teddy. If this wasn't predetermined, then I think Fangio really messed this up somehow. If there's three preseason games and you've already announced, you know, before the fact that Locke is starting one and Teddy is starting one, how do you make a decision after Let's say it was 1-1 after two games. Why wouldn't you want to go into the third game and then make your decision based off that? What's another week if you've gone months now with this quarterback competition? So, yeah, it's weird. Like I said, Drew Locke played a hell of a game in week one, and then he didn't play as well in week two, even though they both had the same number of completions. But it seemed like Fangio needed the second game to confirm it should be Teddy Bridgewater, and he based his decision on that, completely overriding the first game. It made no sense. I don't know. Um, burn the guitarist, AKA Zach. Great to see you, buddy. He says, I was honestly surprised that the emoji indeed has two gloves. Yeah. He's, he's throwing in his support here for Teddy, two gloves. So we love seeing that guys rally behind Teddy Bridgewater right now, close ranks around him. Even if you were really pulling for drew, even if you've got a drew lock Jersey hanging in your closet, rally behind Teddy, because that's, what's in the best interest of the club. Yep. Yep. Uh, Mike, sorry. Thank you for that super chat, bro. He says here, uh, flashbacks of Kyle Orton. We're going to go. Uh, we are going to win four games early. Then every defense will load the box and dare Teddy to go deep. He doesn't have the juice. I hope not. But even you just mentioning Kyle Orton and early starts, man. The trauma of the 2009 season just came bubbling back to the surface when Josh McDaniels, after his controversial decision to trade Jay Cutler, bringing in Kyle Orton as part of the deal, he looked like the smartest dude in the room when the Broncos got out to a 6-0 and start. He even beat the Patriots, right? He even beat his mentor and every Bill Belichick and running around the stadium after that game, and you're like, gosh darn, Pat Bowen knew what he was doing here. And then, as you mentioned, it was like that Weezer song, the sweater song, pulling the thread, comes undone. That's exactly what happened. Defense has said, okay, cool. We see how you're going to roll here. Let's flood the short area zone, stack the box, and see what you got. They were found wanting. We got here, Zach, another superstar we haven't seen for a minute. Oh, uh, Josh. Josh in the hizzy. Thank you for that, bro. He says, I'm back. Chad, my brother, uh, in tunes. We're both into punk rock. And Zach, my angry Bronco spirit animal, not happy with um, five with Teddy at QB1, but I hope we play well on all levels. That said, 
How short a leash are we giving Fangio? I have less faith in our staff than I do Teddy. I agree on that last point. I have more faith in Teddy being able to kind of hold his own out there than I do in the Broncos coaching staff uh, being able to overcome their own foibles. And in terms of the leash I'm giving Vic Fangio, like I said, he should be judged as harshly as we're judging the quarterbacks and every player on this team. I mean, he's under the gun and coaching for his life as well. That's why he's under an edict, I believe. Playoffs or bust, Vic. You, you made your bed with the quarterback now. You have to lay in it. Keith says, with the offensive line being our biggest weakness, doesn't Teddy make the most sense? Um, I'm not sure that's our that's the Broncos' biggest weakness. And I'm not saying that to be argumentative. I'm, I Honestly, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here. You've got an all-pro left tackle. You've got a 10-year vet at right tackle. You've got a high round pick, a premium round pick at center in year two. You've got a premium round pick at left guard in year three. And you've got one of the highest paid guards at right guard. This is the year that the offensive line is expected to take a massive step forward. Um, But Teddy does make sense, guys, on a lot of levels. He really does. Did it make more sense than Drew? Depends on where your priorities lie. And the Broncos telegraphed in that decision, for better or for worse, and it's hard to blame them after five years of losing, but they said their priority, Zach, is today. Winning now. Damn the torpedoes of the future. Yeah, and, and someone asked, and I was going to answer it anyway, what's our biggest weakness then? I would say quarterback. And I would have said that yep. whether it's Locke or Teddy Bridgewater. This, this, this Broncos offense, this Broncos team it is loaded for bear. This is such a deep and talented roster. And you look around the offense, Chad laid out the offensive line. We all know about the receivers. We all know about the running backs. We know about the tight ends. The biggest weakness is quarterback. And if they can overcome that weakness, they're going to be a good team. So that's why there should be more optimism in Broncos country and not pessimism right now. Nuggets, what have I said tonight that is hating on Teddy? For real, what have I said tonight hating on Teddy? Tell me in the chat. I want to know. Okay, because if I if what I'm saying, if you're interpreting that as hating on Teddy, I want to know because I don't hate on Teddy. I got nothing against Teddy. I respect the hell out of Teddy. I think Teddy is a solid NFL Q, phenomenal leadership skills, really savvy between the years. I just question his wherewithal as far as the physical traits. He's been able to survive and bounce around based on those first two things I mentioned, right? The between the years and the and the leadership. But my dog, there's a reason he's on his fifth team since entering the league as a first-round pick in 2014. Is that me hating on Teddy? If that's your definition of me hating on Teddy, dude, you got to come up with a new definition for the word hate, my dog. I'm so proud of you, Chad. I felt that right here. (laughs) (laughs) Robot of Doom, what's good? He says, good evening, Broncos country. I'm over the sadness of yesterday, but I'm ready for Teddy KGB Bridgewater. KGB. What what does that mean? I mean, I know what the KGB is, but I'm trying to see what's what's that relative to Teddy. I don't know, but still, robot, we feel you. We want to see Teddy do well. Let's hope all of this becomes moot uh, because Teddy goes out there and uh, crushes it. All right. Okay, Zach, we're at 48 minutes almost, so let me see where else... I don't want to leave anyone out in the cold here. So let me grab Randy. Thank you, Randy. Supporting on Facebook, supporting on YouTube. Props. He says, just coming in to show my support. Look forward to this podcast and your guys' insight every day. Best show on the web. Hey, thank you, Randy. We got the best audience on the web. Yes, sir. That's for damn sure. Yes, sir. Mark Lindemuth says, who remembers that Jets game that was supposed to be a gimme and they stomped a mud hole in us? Yeah, the... uh, that was the Keenum year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because mm-hmm. that was Philip Lindsay's. Wait a minute. Now I'm, I'm confusing the Baltimore and the Jets game. I thought it was 2018, too. That's the first thing that came to mind. Because 2018 was Philip's rookie year, and it was the Ravens that he got that, um, where he got pulled out. You know, he got disqualified from the game member for punching in the pile. Uh, so I think it was 19. I think it was Vic's first year. So I think it was Darnold's second year. And yes, we remember that, Mark. 
the Jets, it was embarrassing. Man. Oh, that Isaiah, was, didn't Isaiah Crowell run for like 200 yards? Was that was yeah, that the game? That was the game. Remember Leonard Fournette with the Jaguars ran for what was it, 200, 250? Mm-hmm. That was great times. Yeah, because that so it was Fangio. Because remember, Fangio had four 200 yard rushers. It was 2019. Yeah, uh, because you later had Derrick Henry, and there's one more we're missing. Either way, yeah, that was that was that was a that was a stomping. If we've ever seen one, my friend, um, Robbie Anderson over the top. Remember that? Oh yeah, didn't Boot look out. great last year either with uh, Sam Darnold trucking Simmons and Kareem Jackson on what a sixty-yard touchdown run. We'll get better luck this time around, though, Chad. When we're there at the stadium, week three. Zach, see if you can find Peter Myhill if he's within your range in the chat because it jumped him. I'll do it the old-fashioned way so Just we don't. Naj. I'm, okay, I'm that's, where you that's are. what I got. What's up, Naj? Pete, we'll get yours next, my friend. Uh, good to see you, bro. And seriously, every night in the chat supporting us, love you. says, hey, brothers, a benefit Teddy will bring to the offense is calm and knowledge. That will help a very young mature, uh, a, a very young group mature, in my opinion. I agree with you on that. And I think for those of you who can remember watching the television broadcast of either of these first two preseason games, specifically I'm thinking of the um, Seahawks game when he got to start there was the camera, you know, that's over in the middle of the field that zooms in right there in front of him as he's calling the play in the huddle. And it, I was paying close attention there, Zach, because what you saw from Teddy was as he's calling out the play, he's looking, going around the huddle, and he's looking every guy in the eye to make sure he gets reflected back to him recognition of what I just said. You know your job. I know my job. And go – and I, it jumped out to me. And I think you're right on that, Naj, that that should be some sort of a stabilizing force for this young crew. I think that's a really good point, Naj. I'll give Teddy that. Uh, psychologically, I think the team will play maybe looser knowing that they don't have to worry about an erratic quarterback under center. They don't have to worry that that quarterback is going to go out and on the first play throw a back-breaking interception or fumble. They can have more peace of mind going into a game, so it can't hurt. And that's what I do like about Teddy. Teddy Cool Bridgewater. We need a better name than that. Better than KGB, though. Apparently, that's what uh, Shannon Sharp says. So ah. we'll find something better. But why? Where does that come from? He's a he's a spy. He's a silent killer. I think that's where he's going with that. All right. So we're farts. My hill. Thank you for that very generous super chat from Down Under, my friend. We got Pete coming to us from the future. From the future. Not, we're not talking Marty McFly. This isn't Dr. Emmett Brown. This is Pete Myhill coming to you, Broncos country, from the veritable future. He says, good morning, Priest. Biggest fear with this decision for me is Teddy doesn't finish out the year. Lock. Um, hold on. I got to go back to the – because I forgot it cuts off. Hold on one sec here. A lock finishes the year and plays well. Then the carousel continues. I wish Teddy well. All I want is solid Broncos football, state of being, go Broncos. I feel you on that. Uh, that's why what, what this did, unless Teddy comes out for real, guys, and it's possible. I mean, you, you never say never in the league. I've been covering this league and this team long enough to know that you've got to really beware using absolutes because you will paint yourself into a corner and look wrong more often than not. So I stray away from them. I, in life as well, if it ain't death and it ain't taxes, there are no absolutes except for, you know, what goes up must come down. I guess we got the, the you know, laws of physics. But I digress. In the case of uh, Teddy Bridgewater, look, man, they kept that carousel thing going unless he does end up, my point being there as I rambled, um, proving to be the exception to the rule and that this is the year for him where all the stars align. Forget all the bouncing around the league. Forget the trades. Forget all that stuff where he was thrown around as a commodity for NFL teams to bargain over. And the combined factors of right place, right time, supporting cast, defense, coaching, all that stuff comes together. And you finally see Teddy realize all that Louisville first round potential. Then you don't got to worry about the carousel because you'll have had your guy now and you can move forward, pay Teddy after this year. And you got a guy that you can at least bank on for the next five years. We'll see. But Chad, has there ever been a player that finally reached his potential, you know, seven, eight, nine years later? I mean, 
Isn't there like an expiry date on when that can happen? I don't know that he'll ever reach what he could have been coming out of Louisville, but hopefully he can be a more stabilizing presence under center. Um, but Peter, here's an uncomfortable truth for you. If you want a good Broncos season, then Drew Locke's not going to play at all because that would entail that Teddy Bridgewater either got hurt or he's not playing that well. So once they made this decision, they are parking Locke squarely on the bench. They don't anticipate him playing. That's only in case of emergency now. Their guy is Teddy. So while I think it could it could be a good season, and I do think it will be a good season, a good season doesn't entail, unfortunately, Drew Locke making starts. Yep. At this stage, I mean, you got to look at it uh, realistically. Eddie Vasquez, what's good, bro? It's been a minute. How are you? Long time listener, been a superstar for – couple of years says i'm just coming back for support and love y'all rock hey dude. thank you eddie thank you zach quick update on our stars for tonight as we are at 55 minutes rapidly closing in on having to sign off for tonight simon still at the top unsurprisingly andrew lampy casey nickel dj ashman a newer name on the stars thank you Whoa. for that support dj you're getting your name in the ring so to speak for uh, that von miller jersey even though you got some ground to make up to have enough tickets to probably really improve your odds, but still you're going to have a ticket in the, in the hat. Ron Frey, Gary Lee's Palmer, Michael Ronquillo, Leaf Roebuck. What's up, bro? Brad Murdoch, Jay Helms, Travis Weber, Brandon Smith, Melvin Paulson, and Jared Fannin. Thanks to each and every one of you. We are keeping an eye out for your comments and uh, questions in the chat. Uh, speaking of the chat, Zach, I'm going to do a little scrollage here because we're about out of time. So let's grab Seth Harmon who is coming off a night where he was very generous last night, throwing down for us, and here he is again. Thank you, bro. He says, Teddy is going to do fine. Can't wait for week one. Your lips to God's ears. Let's hope. And I can't wait either because, again, whether no matter if it was Locker or Bridgewater, I think we're in for a good season. So it cannot get here. September 12th cannot get here fast enough. Uh, all right, let me see here. I want to try to get to... Try to get to everybody. And yes, Andrew, hey, you the man, brother. We'll consider it your football tithe. You know what I'm saying? Love you. Uh, Mark, just happy not to see the rage there was last night. <laughs> hey, man, we title these the gut reactions for a reason, whether it's coming off a momentous you know, development or immediately following a game or whatever. We call it the gut reaction for a reason. We're not going to sit up here and uh, try and tell you that we don't, we're not trying to suppress our passion as uh, sports fans, a, as people in the sports media landscape. All right, we're not we're not going to get up here and try and give you some canned, boring ass balance. You could get that anywhere. You can go get that anywhere, guys. When we do a gut reaction, it's no holds barred for us. We're just going to tell it like it is. Right. And sometimes it comes out a little saltier, a little hotter than maybe in a perfect world we would prefer. That's why we have the aftermath episode, because by then, hey, we've worked out the hormones, all right? We've got our full perspective right, and we can come at you with the most measured approach and takes possible. But my opinions today are no different than they were yesterday. I might just be delivering them a little bit differently, but my opinions are, are the same. And it's no holds barred for the fans as well, Chad. That's what makes it so unique for us is that we take every sort of question, whether it's praise or whether it's criticism. Some guy wanted to fight me yesterday, but we still take it all and we're, we're completely objective in our analysis. But like Chad said, we're never going to change who we are either. We're going to give you our honest opinion and it's up to you guys to run with it or not. Leaf, Teddy's cool, man. How can you dislike a guy who comes up with the jungle fur coat comment? That was legendary. Yeah, major props. He said, I'm a survivor, man. If you throw me in the jungle, I'm going to come out wearing a fur coat. I love that too, man. That's poetic. I think the way his teammates like him swayed the call. Drew just needs a bit more seasoning. He'll get his shot and wow some peeps. Too bad the coaches are stuck in the last century. Go Broncos. Hey, we'll see, man. I don't think he's going to get that shot in Denver, though. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's immaterial to think what he could be because his career as a starting quarterback essentially is over in Denver. So wish him well in his next endeavor. Jay Helms, what Teddy? Uh, what if Teddy plays absolutely horrible versus the Ram and Rams and Locke throws three Ts? Won't matter. It'll get explained away by the coaches, and uh, they're dug in now. They have to justify that decision now. 
for better or for worse. So it ain't going to change anything. And then Brad says here, if they can't win the first three games in September, time to take a long, hard look at Fangio. Oh, yeah, man. You know, I think they will, though, honestly. And I, I really do think they'll at least win two of those games, give themselves a fighting chance. Albert Knoppers, sorry to say, but the greatest weakness with the Broncos. Yes, Fair. there it is. Special teams. Yep. Um, okay. Zach, I'm going to grab the next closest. Um, if you would grab this from Savage Boy Kev, I'm going to check the back end real quick and see where we're at. Yeah, like Savage Boy hopping in here. Appreciate you uh, tuning in on Twitch, I believe that is. Uh, people who are saying that Chad and Zach are hating on Teddy are simply hating. Hashtag let them hate. Listen, you guys can think that we're hating even though we're presenting our opinion and we're presenting what we believe are stats. I mean, saying that Teddy's never thrown for more than 15 touchdowns, that's a stat. Saying his arm isn't as powerful as Drew Locke's, that's a fact. I mean, we're just basing it off that, not necessarily our emotion. If you guys disagree, that's one thing. We'll always have responsible discourse, conflicting discourse. It's when it becomes ad hominems and personal attacks that it becomes unnecessary. So you guys can hate on us all you want. I think we're still optimistic, though, Chad, you and I, and we're ready for a Broncos season. Nothing but love for Teddy Bridgewater. Yep. I got some serious questions about Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer, but yep. nothing but love for Teddy. He did what he was asked to do. Caleb Fink, thank you for that super chat, my friend. Make sure you connect with us on uh, Twitter so that we can – Shout you out after the show. Mike, sorry. I, Mike, I can't flash this on the screen uh, because we're about out of time, but he says on a super chat, Zach, I don't want to seem like I hate Teddy. I hope he kills it. But what happens if Locke balls out in the last preseason game? Yeah, Doesn't dude, uh, we mentioned this on a, on a previous um, you know, answer, but nothing is going to change that, brother. T- Teddy is now the starter of the Denver Broncos, and we can sit here and debate if that were to happen how short of a leash Teddy might have. But I think he already has a fairly limited leash. Fairly limited. Fangio said he wants to see him finish the season, and of course you would say that, right? You just named him the starting quarterback. But what's going to happen if they lose two or three games in a row? Time will tell. It's not going to change anything, but boy, oh boy, would Vic Fangio have egg on his face if if – Bridgewater melted down and locked through, and he had a really good game against the Rams. It's going to put the pressure more so on Vic that he made the right call. And God forbid, God help Vic Fangio if Teddy doesn't come out in week one and and be impressive. Back, we've got a couple here from Nathan. Nathan wants to know which rookies in the division outside of Denver do you think will make the most noise this season? Um, That's a good question. Let me. Uh... I would have to pull up the draft classes. I mean, the first name that came to mind, I don't know about noise, but Rashawn Slater, the new tackle with uh, the Chargers, I think he's going to be a good protector. I wanted the Broncos to take a look at him in the draft. Um, that's one name that jumped to mind. But you um, have to see the draft by. classes. I'm, I get, I'm trying to do a refresher. You're asking the wrong guys, dude. We're not the, we're not the draft guys that uh, catalog and chronicle every single draft pick. That's freaking Nick. Uh, Eric, Lance, Carl, those guys could roll a dex every name off the tip of their tongue, tell you where they went, what round, all that stuff. But you're right. For L.A., Zach, it's Rashawn Slater was the first-round pick. Asante Samuel Jr., interesting slot corner, right. was their yeah. second-round pick. Um, I'm not really seeing anyone else in their draft class to to write home about. Let me take a look real quick at – I know the Chiefs got a tackle too. Uh, the, it was, uh, Trey Smith, I think his name is. They, he, they got him for a steal. They got him in, in later than he should have gone. I think he's going to end up starting for them as well. I'm trying to think of their draft classes, though. All I know is the Broncos got a pretty good one and Patrick Sertan in the first round. Yeah, so the Raiders drafted the uh, offensive tackle slash we'll see where they play him. Uh, Alex Leatherwood and then Trevon Morig, very talented safety. safety. I was really into him out of TCU. Uh Tyree Gillespie, another safety, very interesting. Mm, let me check the Chiefs real quick, and then I'll answer this question real quick here. Um, okay, the Chiefs, Zach, drafted uh, – they didn't have a first-round pick. They drafted Nick Bolton, the linebacker uh, yeah. from Mizzou, right, if I remember right? from Yeah, Mizzou. Uh, Creed Humphrey, who – Yeah, another second-round pick. 
So I don't know, man. I don't think there's really any super hot yeah. rookie outside of Denver to really right. hang your hat on. Maybe Asante Samuel in LA. I mean, there aren't really any big time heavy hitters, whether it's a defensive position or like skill positions that. Yeah, I think Patrick Sertan, Javante Williams, they pop off the screen to you right away. And it seems like the best picks that the, some of these teams made, like Kansas City and Los Angeles, they were offensive linemen. One name, though, that rookie that's pop, if you haven't watched Hard Knocks yet, Micah Parsons in Dallas is balling out right now. And I still think he would have been a great pick in Denver. Um, Nathan, by the way, thanks. He says, love the show from Long Beach. Very cool. The LBC checking in. Gotta love that. Um, Oh, and then it just jumped. All right, we got two more guys, and then we got to go for tonight, okay? We're at an hour and four, so we're a little bit long. I thought I could grab it. I can't. Oh, that's Nathan. Hold on. There's a couple more. There we go. Let me grab uh, Jess. Good to see you, Jess. He said, I knew you guys were going to bring fire yesterday. <laughs> Thumbs up. Yeah, it was. Uh... Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Hold on. Let's grab the, let's grab the Duchess. Yep. That's why I missed it. Thank we you. We got you, Michaela. Don't worry. And guys, just like Michaela did, if we're in the middle of a chat and you can feel that we're winding down and we haven't heard you haven't heard your name yet on a super chat, just ping us like Michaela did because we don't want to miss a single one. We want you guys to to get your recognition and your answers uh, when you support us like that. Michaela, the Duchess of MHH, flexing out two nights in a row. She says, is Fangio McDaniels 2.0? Because I'm having deja vu. Hashtag MHH, hashtag fire Fangio, LOL. I don't know. I don't want to openly campaign for firing Vic Fangio. He's going to live and die by that decision, and only time will tell whether it, which one it is. But is Fangio McDaniels 2.0? No, I wouldn't say that, although some similar things in terms of the controversy at quarterback, and it didn't have to be that way for either of them. Like Both guys, especially in retrospect, you look at Josh McDaniels and you're like, what the hell? I mean, we knew we knew that this then. What the hell were you thinking? Yeah. Trading away a franchise quarterback that just came off a of Pro Bowl, and that was a legit Pro Bowl year for Jay Cutler, two thousand eight. What were you smoking, dog? I have a sinking feeling in my gut. We're going to be saying the same thing about Vic Fangio ten years down the line over yeah. this. Yeah, history will not look back kindly, I feel like, Chad, on this era of the Broncos. I, I, VJ was closer to McDaniels 2.0 than Fangio is, but that being said, I still think uh, one thing all three men had in common, Chad, or have in common, they're better suited as coordinators and not head coaches. Most definitely. All right, last super chat, and then we'll do one last check on Facebook, and then we're out. Tony D.A. Dove. Dove down in L.A. What's up, brother? Good to see you. He says, Teddy, it is. Now, let's put dubs up. As for Drew, let's be honest. As an organization, we don't develop young quarterbacks. Wish we would, though. Go Broncos. That's true because to develop a quarterback, you have to complete the process. And that's what's so frustrating is it's like, guys, you, you, you've, got, you've moved the needle on developing this young Q close to – I mean, if, you're, if you looked at Drew Locke as a meal in the microwave and you're just standing there waiting for it to ding so you can feast – you know, let's say it was a five-minute cook on your rice bowl. You're looking at like 30 seconds left, and then you're like, now nah, I'm going to go get something else. Rationalize. I mean, Teddy Bridgewater is like getting a hamburger from McDonald's, and Drew Locke is like actually having the cow. You know, and then having to kill it, you know, slaughter it, get the meat, prepare the meat, prepare the food, whereas instant gratification is going out and getting a pre-made burger from McDonald's. So I hope he puts up victories as well. I still think he he will. I just don't really uh, – I'm not too crazy about, like Chad said earlier, it's nothing against Teddy. He did what's asked to him. He can only play with the players that are in front of him. I don't know about Vic Fangio right now. That's all I'll say. All right, guys, here's our last roundup on uh, Facebook, and then we are going to say goodnight for now. And no surprise, Simon maintained his status atop this particular depth chart. Love you, Simon. Thanks, buddy. From Canada, by the way, proving Broncos country is not a geographic location. It's a state of being. Andrew Lampy at number two. Uh, DeAngelis Jones, thank you, bro. Appreciate that. Um, you got your name in the hat, man, for the giveaway. Michael. Casey, DJ, Ron, Gary, Leaf, Brad, 
J, Travis Weber, legendary Travis Weber is, Brandon Smith, Melvin, Jared, thanks to each and every one of you, and thanks to all of our listeners, whether you're with us live or if you're hearing this after the fact on demand. Thanks for another great week of podcasting. This has been a lot of fun this week. Been juggling a few things in my personal life, and this helps to do that. This helps to take the edge off on when things uh, get a little bit hairy or things are happening off the field, so to speak. So shout out to all of you. Thank you. Appreciate you. We'll see you Saturday is the Trickle Zone at noon Mountain Time for our Facebook supporters. Broncos Book Club at 2 p.m., same day. And then Kelberman's Corner, Sunday, noon Mountain Time. And with that, Zach, sign us off, brother. We will see you guys then. Chad, have a great weekend. Everyone have a great rest of your Thursday. Have a great weekend. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight and this week. This has been the Huddle Up Podcast. In the meantime, until we see you next time, be sure to follow the Huddle Up Pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main mothership account at Mile High Huddle for your one-stop shop of Broncos news, analysis, rumors, video breakdowns, and so much more. Follow Chad on Twitter, as you can see, at Chad N. Jensen. You can follow me at Kelberman NFL. Be sure guys if you haven't already go to huddleuppod.com and get your swag on get yourself a hat shirt coffee cup hoodie everything and anything is in that store also facebook.com slash mile i huddle chad just talked about the three shows we have right now the flagship shows coverman's corner broncos book club trickle zone more content on the way we appreciate every single person tuning in also facebook.com slash mile huddle pod like that page and follow that page but As always, if you can't do any of those things, we love you and respect you and appreciate you. We just ask these three things that take a few seconds. Subscribe, like, and share. This video and every single damn video you see on the MHH channel helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. We are off until this weekend, guys. We have the exclusive Facebook shows and also the Huddle Up podcast Sunday night. Take care, guys. Have a great weekend, and as always, go Broncos.